Good morning, everyone. And I think this is on. Can everybody hear me? You can't hear me. Now you hear me. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Uh, first of all, let me say welcome to all of you to this 2013 Griffin Bell Convocation. Faculty, staff, students, special guests, we're glad you're here. We uh, appreciate your supporting our convocation series. Today is special. Uh, and we have a lot of special guests that I would like to recognize before we move into the main program. First of all, there are members of the Bell family who are here, those who have actually made this lecture series possible. First of all, Mrs. Nancy Bell, the, the widow of the late Judge Griffin Bell, her son and local businessman, Mr. Holm Kinnebrew, and his wife Janet. Uh, and again, uh, we're also happy to have with us today one of our most generous benefactors, this is Betty Pope and her daughter, Ms. Carrie Post. Also very pleased to have Mr. Clayton Coleman and his wife, Linda, here with us today. Clayton happens to be a longtime friend of mine uh, and a fellow member of the proud class of 1960, Gainesville High School. Uh, Gainesville, Florida, by the way, if you can uh, let me slip that in. Uh, they also happen to be the parents-in-law of our special speaker today. Uh, also, we're happy to have Mr. Clay Coleman, who is the husband of our special speaker, and their two boys, Heath and Beckett. And then we're also proud to have with us today Miss Jean Dickey, former Jean Hart, who was also uh, a member of the great GHS class of 1960. Glad to have you here, Jean. She now lives in Columbus, by the way. And finally, uh, my wife, Dr. Connie Blanchard, uh, who, by the way, was not a member of the GHS class of 1960. <laughs> in fact, I suspect if she had known me in high school, she would never have married me. <laughs> but uh, on a serious note, the, uh, the Griffin Bell Lecture is made possible every year by a generous gift from the Griffin Bell family. We're indebted to the family, in particular Mrs. Nancy Bell, for supporting the university in this way. And again, we, we thank them. Griffin Bell was a, a legend in his own time and will long be remembered as one of the most brilliant, influential, and distinguished leaders in Georgia history. He's best known for having served as the United States Attorney General during the Carter administration in the 1970s. As the Attorney General, he restored ethics to the Justice Department, instituted major procedural reforms, and reestablished the Department's credibility. In the process, he earned a reputation as one of America's greatest Attorney Generals. Earlier, he served for over 14 years as a federal judge in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. During his time on the Fifth, Court, or the Fifth Circuit bench, Judge Bell played a major role in guiding the South through the turbulent 1960s in the American Civil Rights Movement. He was also a partner at Skin, King & Spaulding, an Atlanta-based law firm he helped turn into one of the largest and best-known law firms in the country. As a lawyer, he handled many high-profile cases with clients such as Exxon, Texaco, Dow Corning, and the Howard Hughes Estate. Judge Bell was an Army veteran, a writer, a charismatic public speaker, and a devoted public servant. He was also the quintessential mover and shaker. Most importantly, though, Griffin Bell was a graduate of Georgia Southwestern who never forgot his alma mater. I had the privilege of getting to know and to work with Judge Bell during the first few years of my tenure here at GSW. Without doubt, he was one of the most brilliant individuals I have ever met. With friends and connections around the world, he was also one of the most powerful and persuasive persons I have ever known. I'm still amazed at the way this man could move mountains by simply picking up the phone and making a call. During his later years, and even today, when anyone in Georgia refers to the judge, it is understood he is talking about Griffin Bell. Sadly, the judge passed away in early 2009 at the age of 90, but he left behind an unparalleled legacy of greatness, success, and service. So it's important that we here at the university make sure that we keep his legacy alive. That legacy, in many ways, is a metaphor for what is best about Georgia Southwestern. This is one reason that I value this annual Griffin Bell Lecture. If nothing else, it's an opportunity for those of us who treasure this institution to be reminded of how fortunate we are to be able to count Griffin Bell as one of our own. So at this time, I would like to introduce 
Dr. Elizabeth Kuypers, who is the chair of the Foreign Language, English and Foreign Language Department here at Georgia Southwestern, uh, who will introduce our speaker, Dr. Kuypers. Good morning. I know this is the time that we always tell you to turn off your cell phones. Um, and while I certainly want you to do that, I also want you to get on Twitter. And I want you to follow Lauren Groff at L-E-G-R-O-F-F. Because -F, you're going to want to know what this fabulous woman is up to. Really, write it down and follow her. I'll, no, I won't read that there. Um, <laughs> Lauren Groff, even in the 100 and 140 characters or less of a tweet, can be prosaic. I witnessed this tweet from two weeks ago. New book just kicked ego in the gut. Ego sniveling in the corner. Libido and id crouched under the house playing with matches. <laughs> Ms. Groff's credentials are undeniably impressive, as are her publications. If you want to know more about her MFA or about her time at Breadloaf, check out her website. If you want to, to read the things that Stephen King, King has said about her novels, Google her. My detailing those achievements won't convince you to read her fiction, so I'm not going to do that. I know some of you are reading Ms. Groff's fiction in your classes, but for those of you who aren't, I'd like to give you a quick rundown. Her first novel, The Monsters of Templeton, was described by Booklist as, quote, a fantastically fun read, a kind of wild pastiche that is part historical novel and part mystery with a touch of the supernatural thrown in for good measure. Told from multiple perspectives, this novel spans two centuries of voices as the main character, Willie, searches the past for clues about her heritage. Delicate Edible Birds is a collection of short stories that Ms. Groff calls fiercely feminist. I'll tease you with a snippet about my favorite, Elle Debard and Aliette, based on the classic love story of Abelard and Heloise. Ms. Groff deftly weaves history into fiction. The setting is New York City during the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic. The heroine is inspired by Ethelda Blibtree, a polio survivor who won multiple gold medals for swimming. In this story, Eldevard is hired to teach Aliette to swim, and their passion is undeniable. Ms. Groff writes, who, in the midst of passion, is vigilant against illness? Who listens to the reports of recently decimated populations in Spain, India, Bora Bora, when new lips, tongues, and poems fill the world? And now, when they don't touch, they share the splash and the churn, the rhythm of the stroke, the gulps of the water in the gutter, the powerful shock of the dive, and awake like smoke trailing them. Beautiful prose. Ms. Groff's most recent novel will resonate with those of us from America since we are home to Koinonia Farms, a utopian community. Arcadia is an exploration of a failed utopia told from the perspective of Bit, the first child born within the utopia. Spanning Bit's life, the novel explores big questions. Ms. Groff has said that the novel asks, how much a person or community can be a part of things? What is the best way to be in a world? How does one reconcile freedom and community? How can a person love this stunning, tragic world we have? In different hands, the story of a failed utopia might be depressing, and it might slip into a dystopia. In Groff's capable hands, the story is one about hope and the nobility of humanity as we strive to care for one another and nurture each other. With pleasure, I give you Lauren Groff. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Um, I haven't been on Twitter recently because I've been trying to write, and I, they don't necessarily go together all that well. 
Thank you. It's such an honor to be here today. Thank you, especially to the family of uh, Judge Griffin Bell. It, it's lovely to, to be here in your presence. Um, thank you, President Kendall Blanchard, um, and the staff, faculty, and students of Georgia Southwestern. Um, I'm going to read you a, a talk I wrote for you. It's called Two Birds False and True, and it's on art and artifice in five parts. The first part, you can sit back, close your eyes, maybe even snooze a little. Um, I won't know the difference. Um, it's a story, so part one. Once upon a time, there was an emperor who lived in a palace that had sumptuous gardens and clear green pools and walls that held the light like fine porcelain. His palace and grounds were of such surpassing beauty that nobody in the court ever felt the need to leave. Best of all the beautiful things in his empire, however, was one that the emperor didn't know he had. A nightingale lived in the forest, a bird that sang so thrillingly that the fishermen reeling in their nets at dusk always had to stop their work to listen. And when the charwomen and children who passed through the forest heard the bird, they stopped short and remembered the times when they were happiest. That's my baby, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about right. Okay. People often came to visit the emperor from far away. After they left, they wrote essays and books about the palace, saving the height of their praise for the nightingale's song. The emperor picked up one of these books one day and learned at last about the little songbird in the woods. He called his viziers together and ordered them to bring him the bird. Though the viziers had forgotten what nature looked like and how swift feathered things could be, a few months later, they were able to find the little nightingale. They ordered her to sing. She was always happy to, and when she did, the viziers remembered the villages of their birth, the smell of wood smoke and baking bread, and the feeling of being safe behind heavy doors closed against the night and cold and wolves. Come sing for the emperor, they begged, and even though the nightingale was a sooty, tiny creature, not at all beautiful to look upon, they asked and asked until she agreed. She said, well, of course I'll sing for the emperor, since you asked so nicely. When at last she sang for the emperor, he dreamt of his nurse's rippling black hair when he was very small. How on cold mornings, when he'd awoken before her, he'd touch her hair and see her breath rise in a cloud above her. When he opened his eyes again, he ordered the nightingale to stay with him. He had a great golden cage made for her and heaped such heavy jewelry on her that she could no longer fly very far or for very long. The years passed, and the bird, being generous, sang for the emperor whenever he wished. And although her songs grew sadder and sadder, he didn't notice. One day, a package arrived from another emperor in a faraway land. The card said, our apologies that this humble bird we have had made is so inferior to your nightingale. When the emperor opened the package, however, he found a stunning automaton bird made of gold and encrusted with jewels. It had a repertoire of a dozen lovely tunes, all of which were suitable for dancing, unlike the real nightingales, which, was for, which were for dreaming. The court was so delighted by this new bird, they played it over and over again all night long. Nobody noticed when the real nightingale slipped out of her jewelry and her cage and flew away through a window that someone had left open. For a week, not a soul in the palace noticed she was gone. They were so entranced by their new gift. And when they did, the emperor grew angry, shouting, such ingratitude. We gave that bird our jewels and made her a vast golden cage. She is banished from our empire forever. But his anger soon passed because he was so busy playing with his singing mechanical wonder. For a time, they were all very happy. But then the automaton nightingale broke one day, and though the clockmaker fixed it over and over, it never quite worked the same. Its 12 songs dwindled to six, then to four, then to one. 
As it lost its songs, the machine became more precious, the emperor ordering new plush pillows for it to sit upon, new necklaces to drape around its neck, a new glass vitrine in which to put it, because even when it was silent, it was beautiful. Then the emperor became gravely ill, and was ill for so long that his viziers shifted their allegiance to the new emperor. The old emperor was left to live out his final days in a dark and lonely room. The mechanical bird was still at his side, and it gave him tremendous joy to look upon it. When he tried to make it sing, though, the bird could not. The emperor, in his weakness, raged at the bird, furious that he had spent so much money and attention upon it. Soon, Deaf came in through the window and sat on the edge of the emperor's bed and began to whisper into his ear. The emperor tried to block out Deaf's voice by shouting at the mechanical bird to sing, but even though he hollered until he wept, the bird never made another sound. At last, the real nightingale, having heard of the emperor's illness, fluttered down to a bough outside of the emperor's room, and, taking pity on the raving man, began to sing to soothe away his pain. As she sang, death faded and grew less heavy on the bed, until at last the covers were unwrinkled and death flew back out the window in a black mist. The emperor sat up well again. Oh, he said to the nightingale, old friend, we had banished you. And yet you, in your kindness, returned and banished death. It was nothing, said the bird. In your honor, the emperor said, we'll destroy this false golden bird that misled us. We will give all of its jewels and its place in the palace to you. And he made as if to hurl the robotic bird to the ground. No, said the nightingale, let the thing be. It served its purpose nobly. Let me return to the forest. You will lead your people more humbly and generously now that you've shown mercy. Then the bird flew off, and the emperor stood and walked into the courtyard, astonishing all who saw him, for they believed him to be already dead. And the emperor and the nightingale and the golden automaton lived happily, not forever after, but for at least a while longer, until death came to the window again. Part two. I stole that song. By song, I mean story, of course. In any case, the original is not mine. It was written by Hans Christian Andersen, the great Danish fairy tale spinner in 1843. The story, Nattargalen, was reputedly inspired by the unrequited love Andersen felt for a Swedish soprano named Jenny Lind. I say reputedly here because Anderson's emotional quotient was never exactly trustworthy in these things. For instance, he once extended a two-week visit to Charles Dickens into a five-week stay, alienating everyone in the family and purportedly giving rise to the character of Uriah Heep, the <laughs> cringing, oily clerk in Great Expectations. Anderson was mortally wounded when Dickens cut off all communications after that nightmare. He thought the visit had gone splendidly. The story of the two nightingales came to you today beautifully filtered through thick layers of language and time. First, Hans Christian Andersen's love was translated into allegory and then again into language and was then refined into finished published prose. A translator carried the story into English, and no matter how good a translator is, migrating a story from one language to another will always modify the original in large ways. The tale was further separated from its source by my reading of it long ago, with my 20th to 20th of 21st century linguistic, educational, and socioeconomic baggage. And because I chose not to revisit the story until I had rewritten it, my memory made another huge leap from its source. In the original, the emperor was Chinese. I think my subconscious was scandalized at the overt Orientalism in Anderson's story and sponged it out. But the best and most subtle distancing of the story from its source happened just now when I read it to you. When my words entered your ears, your brains sparked off vast neural webs of associations and images unique to you some perhaps informed by your own reading of the same story or similar fairy tales. It may have brought back the first brittle and silverfished edition of Grimm's you found in your local library's stacks, or your older sister, with a flashlight, 
reading to you illicitly when you were supposed to be sleeping. Or you may have had a second story unfurling underneath the surface story that I read. Your brain infilling Steve Jobs in the place of the emperor, turning the golden bird into a sleek silvery iPad. The story was further infiltrated by the immediate sensory information that became part of the story's DNA within you. The face of the stranger sitting beside you became the emperor's face. The almost inaudible hum of the lights became an echo of the false nightingale's song. Your rumbling stomach lent discomfort to the poor emperor when he was ill in his deathbed. The story finished itself inside of you, its recipient very far from where it began, but still somehow itself. This is a small miracle, I think. Here's another miracle. This mutation happens every single time you hear or read a story, every time you engage with any work of art. One large definition of art could be the change that happens at the moment when two minds touch. This idea ravishes me. This makes me continue to work even when I am profoundly discouraged, writing the same curse word over and over on my sheet of white paper to get to the quota of words I need to finish that day's work. And I do do that. <laughs> it carries me through the thought that one of my stories, in essence my own disembodied mind, waiting for another mind to come along and regard it for a time the possibility of deep human contact even when I am not present. In fact, the idea is so beautiful it makes me want to sing. I won't. Don't worry. The idea that art is collaboration, that it becomes real in the minds of the listener or reader or audience, is not the way we generally look at it. We generally imagine art in commodifying terms. There is a fabricator, there is a consumer. We see novels with one name emblazoned on the covers. If we are lucky, we buy a bad Picasso, because any Picasso is better than none. Even an art filtered through interpreters still bears a single source name. It's William Shakespeare's Hamlet, even though there are actors on stage and a horde of invisible directors and customers and script supervisors. It's Sergei Rachmaninoff's Caprice Bohemienne, even though it takes a conductor and a full orchestra to achieve the music. But fairy tales are different. It's taken for granted that fairy tales are at their roots a folk art, an oral art, stored inside brains and not necessarily inside the covers of books. It's taken for granted that they are not, for the most part, single source stories. And aside here, Hans Christian Andersen is, curiously enough, the major exception. From the Brothers Grimm to Charles Perrault, to the anonymous editor of 1001 Nights, books of fairy tales have almost all been accepted as multiply sourced compilations. This chorus effect, or palimpsest effect, whatever you prefer to call it, is where fairy tales get so much of their power. And the idea that behind this text before you is an earthy people smelling of sweat and potatoes and cowhide and mud, huddled in the middle of winter milking that last bit of fire, because if they had clocks they'd see, to their dismay, that though it's dark outside is still only six o'clock, and there's only so much sleep or naughtiness that a hard-working soul can get up to after all in the night. And so, stories. Stories pass from generation to generation, mind to mind, whittled down with the exigencies of retelling, or given greater urgency because of thematic resonances in actual events, wars or plagues, a daughter's unexpected marriage, or a third son's imminent adulthood on a farm too small for three sons, a farm on which his heartbroken parents must soon send him away to find his own princess and his own gold. A story stored in a brain can easily be modified to make passive-aggressively clear that you, specific pregnant lady, who refused to share your Rapunzel plants with the pregnant neighbor girl with serious cravings, you were acting like a witch. That's another glory of fairy tales. Like all great literature, they are both specific and general at the same time. By the time fairy tales make their way into a book, they have been made supple and clear. Putting a folk story into a book solidifies and preserves what was ephemeral about them. 
Think peaches on the brink of rot, rendered into jam and put on a shelf. And those stories are now accessible to any mind who can put, pick up a book and read it. Because of their long heritage, they are still endlessly modifiable, endlessly interpretable. I love fairy tales because they are bones licked clean. You can hang your own feathers and flesh upon them. The creature you end up with, scarlet skinned and purple of plumage, like a Vegas dancer, will not be my gilled and webbed and clammy thing. These bones are powerful, radioactive. These bones glow in the dark. Part three. I have been consumed recently by ideas about artifice and art. The subject has been waking me up in the middle of the night. And because the things that normally wake me up at night are imaginary robbers, possible pandemics, sick children, and future apocalypse, I am not ungrateful. I've been thinking a great deal about artifice and art because fiction, my chosen world, the place I would like to live until I die, has been put under a great deal of pressure in the past few years by people who argue that fiction and literature has lost its cultural relevance. Here are some of their arguments. There is a place for fiction, they say, but that place is Hollywood and television. The best writers are flocking there. As proof, they submit the enormous sums of money that audiences throw at on-screen entertainments, some of which does trickle down to the writers, and my bank account agrees with this, by the way. <laughs> they say, because of technology, because of all these apps going at the same time, Angry Birds and Twitter and Facebook and iTunes and iChat and Gmail open all at once while you type your sociology papers on Microsoft Word, the critics say our attention spans are shrinking and the long, empathetic uh, submerging that one must undergo to lead, read literary fiction is no longer something that readers are willing to do. Long before the internet, T.S. Eliot described it as being distracted from destruction by destruction. Relatedly, they say that novels in particular are a 19th century art form that has no place in today's world. They say this because facts are so readily available to everyone nowadays that the artifice that goes into making fiction into art has increasingly rung false for our world. Everything that goes into making fiction, the creation of imagined characters, situations, worlds, the arc of the story, artfully crafted dialogue, all formed to emotionally manipulate the reader. All of this is buried by the avalanche of truth rushing down at us from the mountaintops. Fiction has become a false form to delineate and describe its time, these critics tell us. Finally, the critics say that only literary fiction still hews to the false assumption of the single creator. The creators of music sample freely. Visual artists from Michelangelo to Damien Hirst have always had assistants do the bulk of the hard work. Movies have credits miles long. A better literary form for our times, they say, is one based on quotation, sampling, pastiche, collage, things that take the collaborative act for granted. An exciting form these days, they say, is one that can't be definitively called fiction or nonfiction, a form based in facts that has to be as shaped as carefully as fiction is shaped. Okay. Though I pay for the bread I eat, through writing the very fiction that these critics disdain, I am grateful for their criticisms. A sturdy art should be able to bear the pressure of close and skeptical scrutiny. And the critics are not wrong. In many things, they're right. There is a lot of money in Hollywood. The huge social realist novel probably should be rethought. Novels have always been works of collage or homage, but writers could make the sources more overt within the text, perhaps. Our attention spans have been shrinking because of technology. Nicholas Carr wrote a book called The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. And if you haven't read it and you're interested, it's very good. You should read it. He talks about the human brain's beautiful plasticity. He says, sometimes our tools tell, do what we tell them to. Other times, we adapt ourselves to our tools' requirements. The internet is a tool reteaching us how to think. All of these things are true. But fiction is not a giant sloth lumbering a bit too close to the tar pits. 
There is life in the old beast yet. Every sentence in the previous paragraph, by the way, was under 140 characters and could have been tweeted. <laughs> tweet, tweet. Okay. Part four. And yet, it's not literary fiction, but the argument here against it that is the artificial bird singing in this particular room. Forget the constituent truths in the arguments I've just laid out. They are seductive and a large part true. And the parts that aren't true aren't worth talking about now. Our time here is limited, and my various rebuttals would be pretty obvious. But let's look at the argument as a whole, that fiction is on its sickbed, listening to death whispering in its ear because the times have changed and we have grown out of the uses of literary fiction. Now, the entire concept of the argument is false because it's predicated on the idea of primacy, hierarchy, that one form of art is more valid or more of its time than another. I'd say that this is an idea rotten at its very foundations. Art is neither competition nor war. Art is, in fact, the antithesis of competition and war. There is no fighting to the death here. We in the audience are not lined up on the bleachers, cheering on our teams. We're not shouting for team collage in the fragmented, cobbled together uniforms versus team hysterical realism in the loose, baggy monster outfits. Nobody wins in art, everybody wins. For instance, Marcel Proust was born in 1871 Gertrude Stein was born three years later in 1874. Their art was contemporaneous, but it is hard to imagine literary work on more distant points of the spectrum. Proust's fiction is, of course, obsessive, stunning in its length and detail, and the perfection of its sentences. Stein's is modernism taken to the extreme, full of wordplay and malleability, absent of most of what we associate with fiction, character development, narrative arc, all of the things that make Proust so marvelous. They have both immeasurably enriched the history of literature. One does not cancel out the other. Humanity is deep enough for both. To extend the idea a little further toward you right now, for those of you who don't care too much about fiction or art and are wondering about the utility of this largely irrelevant fiction writer spraying her ideas about art in your direction, just because science, technology, engineering, and math are quantifiably good, it doesn't mean that history, philosophy, English literature, and studio arts are bad. A sophisticated and intelligent community, a sophisticated and intelligent person, puts equal importance on inquiries that are fact and reason-based as they do on inquiries that are exploratory, creative, image-based. The current urge to privilege the former over the latter is extremely dangerous, and if we are not careful, can lead to a populace that has great ease with calculus, but cannot reason deeply and carefully. <coughs> One thing that a life in fiction has taught me is to be very wary of being seduced by absolutes. A loud insistence on superiority is the symptom of an impoverished mind. As F. Scott Fitzgerald said, the, first, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. The universe, oh, thanks, all right. all right. The universe is vast. There is enough room. The biggest word in the world is and. Science and the humanities, fact and fiction, technology and long span empathetic immersion, traditional storytelling and the new collage based hybrid of fact and fiction. Part five. So let's return to the story of the nightingale. Because, as we have seen, fairy tales can hold many truths in them at any time. Every interpretation is relevant because by the time that the story reaches you, it is yours. Now, the story could be a warning against technology in the form of the robotic bird, which distracted from the flesh and blood bird and broke and could not save the emperor's life after all. 
We could read the story as saying that one should not be so enchanted by the things we make with our own hands, our cell phones, our iPads, our flat screen televisions, because they are, the on they are only simulacra of life. They are not life. The story could be a parable about art itself. One should not prize art, the beautiful creation of humans over the real. This could be a cautionary tale for those of us who choose to live lives under the wings of art, a reminder to come out and spend some time with our families once in a while, Lauren. <laughs> and it struck me this morning that the story could be an allegory also for a midlife crisis, a second marriage for the emperor throwing over his less attractive first bird wife for a new trophy wife. <laughs> The story could also even support the modern critics of fiction. It could be a parable for storytelling, where in the artifice of fiction, the me mechanical bird is ultimately a disappointment, and the real bird, the facts, are what will banish death. Remember, though, the end of the story. The living, singing nightingale is the tiny, dun-colored hero here. When the emperor offered to destroy the golden bird that distracted him from her, she told him no. She said that the mechanical bird had served its function nobly and should be treasured for it. In her infinite wisdom, she understood that the world was better for having real nightingales and mechanical nightingales in it. And so here are my final words for you. Let there be space in your own lives for ambiguity and confusion, for art and artifice for fact and fiction, for the golden created and the soaring real. And we will all live happily ever after. The end. Read a 
about how Arcadia came about. Can you tell everybody else about that? Sure. So um, the, the question was about how Arcadia came about. Um, my oldest son that gets here, he's four. Raise your hand. Yeah, he's four and a half. He's very sweet. Um, when when this book was um, when my first book was about to come out, it was 2007, and Beckett wasn't a person yet. He was in my belly, um, and and I'm not the best pregnant person. I get very hormonal and very sad. Um, you were worth it. Um, <laughs> But, um, and, and I just didn't know how to be a, a human being and write and be pregnant at the same time. So I decided I needed to have a project that I believed in very deeply. Um, and because I, I, I do wake up because of fears of pandemics and the possible apocalypse, um, um, I wanted to address how to live in this world that I felt at, the, at that time was going downhill really, really super fast. Um, so I started looking into happiness, and I started looking into idealists, and I started to looking, in, looking into utopias, because America is a utopian experiment, um, just, you know, from when, when the first settlers came from across the seas. Um, and I went to places um, all over the country. I went to the farm in Tennessee, and I went to uh, Oneida, which was a former um, experiment. And, um, so this book was born out of uh, pregnancy, literal pregnancy, <laughs> depression, and pregnancy. Um, and it, yeah, yeah. And then four years later, it came out, which is pretty much how it happened. Four years later, if you sit down every day and revive the heck out of it and cry a lot, it'll come out. So it's just a lot of work. But work is good. We love work. Yes. In Arcadia, I noticed that the names of your characters are, they, they, I thought, that name's familiar, and, and like Merton, for instance, yes. was he a doctor, or a, was he a Dr. Merton? Professor Merton. <laughs> and I thought, my first thought was Thomas Merton, and I thought, well, there gotta be, there gotta be significance in the names that you choose for these characters, like Abe, and you know, different things. Bib, of course, is explained, but I just wondered if you thought about do these names just pop out to you, or do you really purposefully name them? So the question is about um, my character's names, especially in Arcadia, um, and, and a lot of them are meaningful. Um, yeah. You know, I, I take names from everywhere, and sometimes characters have to be a certain name. Hannah has to be Hannah. She just was born in Hannah. Um, my, my oldest son's name is Beckett, and the, uh, that's where Bit comes from. Bit. Um, um, and, and they were, they were very similar in a lot of ways too. And, um, he's a beautiful kid. Um, but yeah, a lot of I, I have fun. I, you know, I think if you read enough Charles Dickens, you will always be tainted by Charles Dickens um, and his naming. And he, he names people better than anyone. You know, Ryan Keith is a great example of just like the easiest way to person. Um, so yeah, it, it's. Anything that makes you want to wake up and go to your book and have fun is a good thing in my book and in the main characters. Yes, sir. Yeah, what uh, writers or artists would you recommend to a young writer who really wants to learn and craft writing and craft? Excellent. Um, everybody heard that, right? Because that was a good projection. Thank you. Um, I would say don't read the books about writing, actually. I say read books um, by brilliant writers. And one of the books that was most profound for me was Housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson. Um, it's just it's just a strange book. It's a way, it's deeply steeped in American philosophy, because she is, but it's, it's, um, it taught me how to write in a lot of ways. I would say read Alice Munro, because you can learn everything from her. If you just read her, then you're set. Life. Um, um, Bartholomew, you know, I would say start with the story writers so that you can you can look very deeply line by line at these short stories and see how masters create the whole. Um, and you know, I think there are really good writing books out there, but I think I think that they sometimes poison the well before people can really figure out what they want to write about. It's probably not a very nice. 
Oh, also, oh, wait, you have Paris Review. I mean, you have to read um, journals, your contemporaries. You know, you have to read the, the stories that are coming out now. Harper's is great, it always has a good story. The New Yorker is always good. Paris Review, Granta. These, I mean, Plowshares. I mean, these are amazing places to go and to, and to find what people are writing about now. So you can steer clear of that and do your own thing, too. How you doing, Heapy? <laughs> I have a question. Mm -hmm. I, you, you've been on talk shows, you get interviewed a lot. Uh, what are some of the dumbest questions you get asked? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, okay, so I'm going to go off on a rampage right now. <laughs> the question is, what are the dumbest questions I get asked? Um, this is not a dumb question. It's just a question that people, I guess, don't think about very much. But uh, they see that I have three books out and two kids. All of these happened within the same time, five years. And they say, how do you balance being a mother and a writer? And on the surface, it's a totally reasonable question, but male writers never get asked this question ever, ever, ever. All right, so we have to take a look at what the gender stereotypes are here. <laughs> it is absolutely unfair that I am being asked this, and yet my husband's sitting in the audience clearly taking care of the kids. Like, he does more than 50% of the work. Um, but I mean, but why? Why are we asked this? Why? It doesn't make any sense to me. Why are we relegated to being only mothers or, or only writers? Why are men never asked about their domestic sphere? Um, why are men never asked about their bodies? I mean, I swear to God, someone people came up to me and they're like, you were a lot skinnier in your picture. And I'm like, that has no bearing on my, you know, arm. Um, people ask about um, I fought for my covers. I don't love my covers of Arcadia, but I fought very, very hard not to get the headless woman shot. And if you go and you look at book covers out there, nearly every woman writer has a headless woman on her book, right? Just with tear down, or shoes, or like something really stupid, patronizing and condescending. Um, and, and you've got to fight really, really hard to keep that away. Um, uh, <laughs> so those are some of the dumb questions I get, and they're almost all gender-based in a crazy, insane way. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's not that I want to beat people up and say things like this to me, but I, I do want to stop and be like, I'm not answering this until I see an instance of women being asked the same question. I'm glad I didn't ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been very nice to you. <laughs> Well, thank you very mm -hmm. much. Thank you. And before we... <laughs> Dr. Piper's reminded me at 1 o'clock in Java City, uh, the uh, author will be there for a book signing. So, uh, 1.30. All right, 1.30, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll be there for one, because I didn't know any better. <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, thank you all for coming, and again, thank you to the panel for making this podcast.